Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on with us Michael Rinder, the co-host of Scientology and Aftermath with Leah Remini. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Mike, we have so much to cover today. I wanted to start <laughs> right away. As always. <laughs> There's always way too much to talk about. Recently, I did a, a post on my blog, The Scientology Money Project, and it was about Tom Cruise filming Top Gun 2 on the USS Theodore Roosevelt, the big stick, the TR herself, CBN 71. Crew aboard the uh, USS Theodore Roosevelt were complaining on social media that Tom was acting very arrogant. He weren't allowed to talk to the actor. Can't talk to him. Have to turn around the hallways if he comes by. And I posted these on my blog, and this was a big to-do. So my question to you, were the sailors on the USS Theodore Roosevelt tracking with how Tom Cruise expected to be treated? I mean, what happened when Tom showed up at a Scientology base? Well, interestingly, Jeffrey, when he would show up at a Scientology base, it was Scientology that laid out the rules about what could or couldn't be done, and in particular, David Miscavige, who would have the staff prepared beforehand and informed them that they were to be attentive, that they were to call Tom Cruise Sir or Mr. Cruise, no Tom, that they were not to put, quote, any bad news on his lines, unquote, that they were to always appear happy and that they were enjoying their job no matter what it was that was going on, that they were not to answer questions other than in the most uh, positive fashion about how wonderful everything was at gold or flag or wherever he was. And these rules were very, very strictly monitored and enforced. Like whenever Tom Cruise was around anywhere on one of the Scientology properties, there were a bunch of people that were sort of the entourage to report back on every moment of his interaction with any other staff members on the property. There was like real time reporting on what Tom's thinking, saying, looking like. Yeah, absolutely. And on what all of the staff members who interacted with him had done and said, how they had acted, had they been appropriate, had they, you know, uh, properly recognized the grandeur and magnificence of David Miscavige, had they explained how terrific it was, the circum the you know, the working environment that they had, how much they loved their jobs, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. The crew aboard that Theodore Roosevelt were staying seemed to align then with that kind of treatment that I guess Tom has come to expect. Yeah, sure. I mean he believes that he is the, you know, second or third biggest being on planet Earth, so he deserves an enormous amount of respect for that. Sure, and he said when he was married to Katie Holmes, you don't understand, there's L. Ron Harvard, David Miscavige, and then me. <laughs> so, <Hey. laughs> the Scientology universe, those are what are called big, big, big beings. Now, Mike, this story made headlines, it went viral in, in uh, social media. Yeah. So, so, of course, Tom Cruise got wind of it. He had to call in his damage control team. The U.S. Navy brass blamed the Theodore Roosevelt crew for misunderstanding an order, which was lame. The order was do not approach actors during filming. Well, that's common sense, right? And don't use uh, phones on the set. But people working on the flight deck of a carrier or an aircraft carrier, I mean, they're smart people. How could you not misunderstand that order? So it was interesting to see how quickly the damage control people kicked in for Tom Cruise. Yeah, of course. And, you know, from the, from the perspective of the Navy or whoever this is, this is, a, this is, you know, an opportunity for them to get good PR and they don't want to mess that up. So they're looking at it from the perspective of what's good for us. And good for us is to keep them, the, Tom Cruise and the production company happy. So you're, you're always going to see that sort of us covering when there are circumstances like that. Sure. And just from my perspective, while everyone, of course, is very 
proud and supportive of the men and women who serve in the U.S. military. Alternately, as a U.S. taxpayer, we, U.S. taxpayers, paid $4.5 billion for the USS Theodore Roosevelt. And, and we pay for it. So my, my qualm was that Tom Cruise is going to make a ton of money on Top Gun 2. And he's going to donate part of that to Scientology. And the Church of Scientology will use Tom Cruise's money to fund fair game, psychoterrorist campaigns, slander, libel, and all other manner of bad, bad acts, bad deeds that violate public policy. So that's my objection. Taxpayers should not fund Tom Cruise's um, money-making schemes that go to finance for a game. Yeah, nor, nor should taxpayers subsidize the fair game itself by Scientology having exempt status. Agreed on that, and that moves us to the next Scientology psychoterrorist campaign known as the Stanley. The Stanley was largely created to fight Scientology in the aftermath. I would say it was entirely created for that purpose. That's when we first started noticing it, because the church, once Leah Remini started Scientology in the aftermath, and the church found out you would be co-host. That, right. had, that had to be a big disaster inside of the Office of Special Affairs. What do we do? Yep. Stanley, for people who are not who don't follow social media, what is it? What's its design purpose? Well, it is presented as JDL modeled thing of we defend the rights of Scientologists and, and decry bigotry and, and discrimination everywhere it is and that this is just a group of, of upset citizens. The truth of the matter is it's literally just another Office of Special Affairs front group that pretends to be this, you know, loose-knit collective of interested, concerned citizens, but is really run by Ed Parkin, who is a long-term nobody in the Office of Special Affairs International, who used to be Heber Gentsch's flunky back in the day, and has, you know, the Peter principle has been applied to him, and he has risen to the top of what this, this, uh, failure of a, of a front group is, what they do and what Ed Parkin does is gathers together uh, typical Scientology smear material um, about anybody that appears on the aftermath or about Leah and me and sends this out on primarily on Twitter but also on their Facebook page and and you know I most of which I can't even see because though I'm one of the main targets of the quote stand league they have me blocked so <laughs> they they're out, out there tweeting shit about me all day long but they don't want me to see it which sort of ought to tell you just about everything you need to know about the legitimacy of what it is that they're saying but this is um, a classic Scientology operation to seek to smear critics. And, and you know, that always has two purposes, Jeffrey, uh, or three purposes. One ostensible purpose, which is to convince the world at large that those who are speaking out about the uses of Scientology not be trusted. But in truth, that never works. And, and nobody ever buys their bullshit. So the second purpose is to be able to point out to Scientologists that come and say, oh, I really were upset about, you know, what I heard, you know, my coworker told me that they'd been watching an episode of, of uh, Scientology in the aftermath and that, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so they're supposed to then direct them to the information provided, this factual, so-called so factual information provided on the Stan website or Stan tweets. And the third thing that it is intended to accomplish is to put in the minds of people who have not spoken out 
that if they speak out, they too will be the subject of this sort of smear and, you know, hopefully give them second thoughts about whether they're going to, to say something or not. So really it's designed to, to exert a chilling effect. And it really hasn't worked, you know, judging from the success of the show, it hasn't worked. And uh, I, I've been on this show two seasons. Karen was in the first season. And I have to tell you, it's the last thing when, when you've been the victim of Scientology fair game, and certainly they've gone after <clears throat> you and Leah, and they've gone after Karen and myself, We've had private investigators out to our house, you know, all the usual stuff, right? Yeah. And that just steals your resolve to speak out, frankly. And I agree with you about that, Jeff. And I don't think that they think that they are going to convince you and me and Leah and Karen or Jeff or Claire and Mark Headley or any of the sort of uh, very vocal people to back off. They don't. They convince us to keep going even stronger and harder. What they are hoping is that they will convince the people who have not yet spoken out mm -hmm. to continue to not speak out. That's the that's their hope. Well, I see. So they want to they want to try to neutralize people who've yet to come forward. Yes, and exactly. Do that that's why why your your statement that, that its purpose is a chilling effect is is absolutely 100% spot on. And that's an important thing for people who have not been around Scientology fair game. Hubbard wrote that critics were to be shuttered in the silence. That is, they want to take away your voice. And one thing Hubbard said that really bothered me early in my career as a Scientology critic, he said that... Um, we, meaning Scientology, we are not the police, but we are slowly teaching the unholy a lesson. If you oppose us, we'll, we'll handle you, basically. We'll attack you. Right. So that in so many words, he said, if you don't attack us, we won't attack you. And you know the policy I'm speaking of? Yes. And that's a really bad deal, but that was L. Ron Harvard's deal. Leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. No, Mr. Hubbard, I don't think I want that deal. I'll gladly willing to take on whatever you can dish out to expose your evil, corrupt cult. So no, L. Ron Hubbard, no David Miscavige. So that's my attitude. And I, I'm not willing to accept the fact that my voice has to be silenced. So they, people like David Miscavige, and even Tom Cruise, who knows what's going on, for him to, to be ignorant is stupid. This chilling effect is very one of the sinister things you and Lee have done such a good job of exposing. Uh, for example, when you guys are filming, they have private investigators following you. Yeah, sometimes and following people from the, you know, the production crew and calling up uh, people, uh, family members of the people who are supposed to be appearing on the show or who have appeared and get it, trying to persuade them to, you know, persuade their family member not to participate. It's like, a, it's like a pretty much a full court press. But I just want to go back to Stan League for a minute, Jeffrey, because you and I have had some back and forth about this, and I have uh, filed a complaint with, or several complaints with Twitter and so of other people, that this is not a legitimate, these are not legitimate Twitter accounts. These are part of an orchestrated campaign intended just to smear people on the basis of their religious beliefs. Look, Scientology loves to play the we're uh, being discriminated against because people are targeting us because of our religious beliefs. Okay, they, they shout bigot all the time and discrimination and we're being, not being afforded our rights under the Constitution. The, and the truth of the matter is that the ones who are really carrying out this hate campaign based on religious belief, the, the ones who are really carrying out uh, the campaign of bigotry and hate based on religious belief is the Stanley. They are targeting me, you, Leah, anybody who has appeared on our show because 
we are not Scientologists because we are vocal Scientology critics because we no longer believe in Scientology. It's not because we're gay. It's not because of our sex. It's not because of our age. It's not because of any other reason than we disagree with Scientology. That, by definition, is targeting based on religious belief. Sure, exactly. It's a, it's a violation of your civil rights and free speech. And what's interesting, Mike, in August, going back with Stanley, I'm going to continue on, there's plenty here. In August of 2017, uh, myself and other people on uh, Twitter, Kelly Kells, and there were some other people, we started noticing by using Google reverse imaging that Scientology Stanley was using stock photos. <laughs> yeah. And this is just outright social media fraud. There's a Scientologist. Right. You, mean, you mean they are using fake Google or just regular old cut and paste images to create fake identities who are quote unquote tweeting on behalf of Stan. Exactly. So, so a stock photo, for people who may not know the term, there are models and you can buy their photos. So if you're a car rental, vacation company, hotel, whatever your business is, you can buy an attractive, good looking model for your advertising, right? Yep. Scientology, because it lacks people, it, it lacks people to put in front of cameras. It has a, a problem that way. You don't want to put, um, say, Ed Park, and initially he, he was just relegated to the side. So they would get attractive people like Rebecca Blair, mm -hmm. and they would choose demographics like we want attractive middle-aged white woman, attractive middle-aged, you know, uh, Latina. And, and they went through all the demographics, right? So we found Rebecca Blair was fake. We found Alicia Hairdo was obviously fake. And everyone's favorite, Alicia Silverson, which sounds like Alicia Silverstein, the actress, right? Yeah. So we, started, we started exposing these on Twitter. And what happened, uh, the fake staff member, Eva Bam, was actually an Italian model named Shiara Ferragani. And her people, her lawyers, wrote a cease and desist to the Office of Special Affairs to knock it off. And they're also Ellis Craig, which is a rugged, good looking guy. Yeah. It's actually a, a model named Gert Rappenacher. So we, we meaning critics, alerted uh, where we could, where we actually had models that we could identify through Google reverse imaging. We yeah. alerted their agencies. Hey, they're using, they're ripping off this image and they're not, and they're not paying you. The church wasn't even paying for these images. So we fought, we fought that war, right? And yeah. you, you covered it on your blog and Tony Ortega covered it. And it's pretty disgraceful that the Church of Scientology with, with its cadre of aging celebrities, none of the celebrities would come forward. And so it actually had to use fake people, which was stunning, but not surprising. Well, forget celebrities, Jeff. Just general, regular, run-of-the-mill Scientologists, they apparently couldn't rustle up enough of them to do it. So they had to resort to fake IDs. And that leads us to, to another interesting thing. After they took an ass beating on Twitter for fraud, outright fraud, and this and this got well covered, and the most interesting recent development of Scan League, uh, maybe a couple of months ago, six months ago, perhaps eight months, a letter appeared on the Scan website, and I go there dumpster diving, I call it, just to see what the other site's up to. Yeah. Um, and you have to read the Scientology websites if you're a critic to see what the, the trend is because they things pop up and disappear. When they get caught, they take stuff down, right? <laughs> what well, yeah. they do, look at look at L. Ron Hubbard's Stolen Valor. So 20 years ago, L. Ron Hubbard was a decorated World War II combat soldier who was wounded, crippled, and blind at the end of the war, right? Yeah. Commander of Corvettes in the North Atlantic, sub hunter, blah, blah, blah. Well, that that litany of L. Ron Hubbard's phony service record, he never served a day in combat. The church has had to walk that back and sterilize it to where right. he served in World War II as an officer. So he didn't, uh, you know, sink German U-boats. He didn't command squadrons of Corvettes and all. He didn't have a bronze star. He didn't have two purple hearts. That's all bullshit. 
Right. And I think any member of the U.S. military should be outraged of Hubbard's stolen valor. And that's the kind of work effective criticism does. It makes them stop lying or at least remove the lies, right? Yep. Okay, so here's the big thing that happened I want to get your impression of. Dr. Cecil Murray, acclaimed former pastor of First Family Church here in Los Angeles, civil rights leader. A letter from Dr. Murray of University of Southern California, it's the Dr. Cecil Murray Center for uh, Religion and Civic Engagement. Yeah. A letter appeared on the Stanley website, two letters actually, from Dr. Murray to Disney CEO Bob Iger complaining about Scientology in the aftermath. Yep. Now, this is from a professor of religious studies, University of Southern California, Dr. Cecil Chip Murray. And I read the letters and I thought, Dr. Murray is writing letters in support of Scientology. Well, I knew that he spoke at the uh, opening of the um, Church of Scientology in Inglewood, I think around 2010. He'd been associated with the church for probably 25 years. So these letters came up. I actually called USC, their public relations department. I contacted the general counsel because they said, why is Dr. Murray being allowed to call for censorship of a television show on USC letterhead? Because a university academic doesn't call for censorship. They call for debate, perhaps. They can do other things, but they can't call for a television show to be canceled. Right, exactly. Now, USC gave me the runaround. And, and uh, one of the people I work with, Robin Athlon Thompson, she's a brand management expert, social media expert. She actually got a response from USC in which uh, USC's Brenda Masio, excuse me if I'm not pronouncing the name correctly, said that Dr. Murray did not write the letters. And I think you saw that, Mike. Yeah, I did. So Reverend Murray stated that he did not write the letters. And what happened is the USC letterheads on the Stanley website went down the letters stayed, however, and were replaced by a first AME letterhead. So oh, wait, Jeffrey, did you did did Chip Murray say specifically he didn't write it, or did USC USC say that he didn't write it? Well, USC issued a statement saying that he did not write it. In fact, I have it right here on my blog. Now, this is where it gets real interesting, Mike. Um, Brenda Maceo. Vice President, Public Relations and Marketing, University of Southern California, said that uh, Reverend Murray, quote, Reverend Murray has stated that he was not the author of the letter that was addressed to Mr. Iger on a discontinued letterhead. We are currently looking into the misuse of the university's trademarks, unquote. So basically, USC, Dr. Murray through USC is saying he did not write the letters. Right. Now, I got up. Okay. Karen Powell, Church of Scientology spokesman who was uh, uh, heard but never seen. And I don't even know if she writes these things. She doesn't. I didn't think so. <laughs> uh, she basically said that Dr. Murray of USC was lying. She wrote in a statement, Reverend Murray confirmed to us his original letter to Disney. So basically the Church of Scientology is saying, oh no, Dr. Murray, you did write the letters. Right. Dr. Murray through USC is saying, no, I didn't. What we seem to have here is Scientology spokesperson Karen Powell publicly calling USC's Dr. Cecil Murray a liar. Dr. Murray's caught out in the middle. We don't know. According to USC, he didn't write him. According to the church, he did. His silence speaks volumes, frankly. The fact that he has not come out and made a statement one way or the other, he is caught between a rock and a hard place. He doesn't want to come out and say anything that contradicts USC, because that's part of his, you know, legacy and where his money comes from. And on the other side of the equation is the Church of Scientology, and that's exactly the same equation. He doesn't want to kick that, he doesn't want to kick that dog and have that dog turn on him. So I suspect we'll never hear from him. And this is sort of a, a Scientology flap made of, you know, as most of them are, created by their own 
willingness to put forth things that are not true and stand by them to the death to assert that they are. And this this is really pretty uh, a pretty interesting microcosm of so many things that happen uh, in, in this sort of arena of the Office of Special Affairs seeking to generate uh, support for their claims of discrimination. And they, they use various techniques and they don't tell people who they're really supporting and they don't inform them that this is their, uh, you know, that this is Scientology, it's a front group sometimes, the people that are informed aren't told that it's going to be made public, etc., etc. These flaps go on all the time because it's becoming increasingly difficult for Scientology to convince anybody anywhere to take a public stand on their side. They're, they're no longer the oppressed minority religion. They are now the accused abusers of people. Yeah, absolutely. I think your point that they're, it's becoming increasingly more difficult for Scientology to find anyone to speak out on its behalf who is not yep. a Scientologist. Now, uh, for many years, they had a uh, disgraced former LA uh, County Sheriff Nibaka appear at their events. Right. He's gone. You know, he seemed to be credible until, of course, he was convicted of felonies. Now he's no longer convenient for them. What makes the um, USC story with Dr. Murray so interesting is USC would very much like for it to go away. But it's not going to. I've tried to reach out to Rick Caruso, who's the uh, director of the Board of Trustees, about this because USC currently has the Dr. Tyndall scandal they're trying to resolve, you know, through a class action settlement. Yeah. But this thing with Dr. Murray it is unique in that the church is standing its ground. So, so Dr. Murray has nowhere to go. Right. That's why I say I don't think that he's going to say anything for some time, <laughs> if ever. Well, you know what was out outrageous about the letters and why part of it doesn't seem credible to me? Uh, supposedly, Dr. Murray, the CEO of Disney, Mr. Iger, and this is what's contained in one of the Murray letters, quote, the African-American community was aggrieved when they learned that you had not answered me, unquote. That means that Mr. Iger had not called Dr. Murray back to answer him about uh, Scientology and aftermath. So the letter continues, quote, they felt, that's the African-American community, they felt that possibly you were sliding me. I could not persuade them otherwise as I have not heard from you. I will not be able to restrain them in their efforts to seek justice on behalf of Scientologists when it was the Church of Scientology who stood beside them through some very dark times, unquote. Now that's basically an implied threat. If we're to believe this letter, Dr. Murray is saying, well, the, uh, the black community is really mad that you won't answer me, and I can't restrain them if they decide to seek justice on behalf of the church. Now, that's the lunatic threat, Mike. That sounds like something written inside of Office of Special Affairs. Yeah, I mean, that's just crazy. Uh, like, first of all, I think that someone, someone from Scientology should get a hold of old Dr. Chip and tell him that you're not supposed to use generalities. Because he's he's spouting off as if he is the uh, anointed representative of the black community in, I guess, the United States, J just Los Angeles, uh, USC, uh, his church. What is he the actual anointed representative of, and who are these people that he's afraid that he's not going to be able to contain? It's so transparently bullshit that I'm I'm sort of surprised that anybody allowed a letter like that to go out. Like when you make a, a claims or threats or whatever, they've got to have some degree of, of credibility in order to gain any traction. If, if I was to write a letter to, um, I don't know, to the FBI and say, 
I want to let you know that on behalf of the in, in the entire citizenry of the United States, that I am upset about your failure to prosecute the crimes of Scientology, and that that I cannot respond to them uh, with anything satisfactorily satisfactory because you refuse to inform me and respond to my letter, and so therefore. The, you know, when, when they take out their wrath upon you, don't blame me. <laughs> now, you laugh, and anybody would laugh, and that's just as laughable as what Chip Murray wrote. It's stupid. It's like, it's, it's ridiculous, and that doesn't mean it's not a threat. It just means it's so absurd that... No wonder Bob Iger didn't respond. Hey, Chip, you know, if you want some advice on how to get Bob Iger to respond, quit sounding like a moron. Yeah, and, and that's assuming that Dr. Murray even wrote the letters. We don't know if he did. Yeah, of and, course. And that's what makes this, this thing so, so damn fascinating is here you have Scientology's credibility on the line. It can't afford to back down. Right. Now there's a, a photo of a photo on the Stanley website of Dr. Murray, along with uh, Reverend Shane Harris and Bishop Craig Warshin of the Agape Church here in uh, Los Angeles at a Stanley meeting. So Dr. Murray through USC went on to say, my presence at your event doesn't mean an endorsement of your position, which sounds more correctly like something an academic would say by way of backpedaling. So Dr. Murray ha is, some, is somewhat of a sticky wicket, and only he himself can clarify it. And the University of Southern California, we need an investigation and not really damage control and hoping that it goes away. That's what I would say to Mr. Caruso. Please, let's have, let's have a very unequivocal statement from Dr. Murray himself. Because basically the Church of Scientology has called him a liar has called USC a liar, and the credibility of both are at stake. And it, it's over the show, Scientology in the Aftermath. So this is, a, this is one interesting outcome that Stanley didn't see coming. And I have to tell you, my being at the event, this, um, this whole dog and pony show the church put on uh, across the street from the Disney Studios, yeah, the entire event was 20 people, I mean, in the audience, you know, and I, and I showed up there to, to film it. And you know one thing that was really funny? There were like 15 Burbank police officers the church had hired for security. And the only real threat to anybody was boredom. <laughs> because it was a really boring event. <laughs> and I think I mentioned you off the air. I was the only person there covering it as a journalist, right? I've been to other events, and usually like at the anonymous protests back in 2008, OSA, public OTs, whatever, they'd always bust on you, right? They'd always hassle you in some way. Name calling, making vague threats, all this stuff, right? But yeah. here because there was but here because there were so many Burbank police officers, my security was assured. The church actually was uh, paying for my security, so I appreciate that. I had a feeling of desperation like this is a last ditch attempt to try to handle Scientology in the aftermath. We're going to appeal to what, God? I mean, L. Ron Hubbard writes that the why is not God. That's one of his famous sayings, correct? That's absolutely right. The why is not God. And yet here, Scientology, which is not really a church, they don't even have a choir, Mike. They don't have a permanent choir. Like the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, they have a choir. Churches have choirs, but the church doesn't have a permanent choir. So they have to rent choirs. And even for their training films, they have to rent actors because they don't have an in-house talent pool, right? So here, this was all rented people doing a hit piece on your TV show. What, what was your impression of the? Honestly, Jeffrey, it was, I, I, I didn't think that it, it, it was a, literally a thought in the wind. Like, I had, it, it didn't have any impact one way or the other, it was kind of amusing when you sent me pictures of what <laughs> what this great event had been. It like this is another thing that these guys should learn. 
if you're going to hold some sort of event, you've got to at least have something that that you know passes the the smell test as to was it worth even attending you can't go complaining about how you you know everybody is supporting you and there is enormous outrage about what's being done because it's discriminating against Scientology and then hold an event with three people no it's you like can't. It's like self. It's it's like self proving your own lie. <laughs> exactly, and I also noticed, Mike, that it was only it was largely the audience was largely members of the Office of Special Affairs. They have a lot of publics in the San Fernando Valley. They could have rounded up fifty to a hundred. You would think, right? Well, you would think, but even even it seems even 50 to 100 these days is a bit of a stretch for any of these ideal logs. So really then they're stuck with using their own staff members in Office of Special Affairs, camera crew from Scientology Media Productions. So the whole, thing's, the whole thing is phony all around. I'm on Twitter right now and uh, Ed Parkin of Stanley. By the way, what is Ed Parkin's background? You said he was Heber Gentry's flunky. I mean, is he South African or where does he come from? No, he's English. Oh, he's, he's British? Yes, he is. And he, I don't know where he originally came from. He's been in OSA Inc. forever. He used to be in the PR Bureau. And he has been uh, sort of a, a behind the scenes guy for a long time until there was nobody else left. And now he's sort of a uh, front lines guy. You know. That's interesting because here you have this unlikely guy at Park. And by the way, he's dull. I, he spoke at this event. He's really dull. Dull as dishwater, you know. No charisma, nothing. You know, Heber Chan really had some charisma. Heber could deliver. Um, yeah. you know, when he was on like with Phil Donahue, you know, other TV, he could do major media. Ed, not so much. He, it's ironic that you had you had Tommy Davis come and go. He sort of imploded in a, a hail of screaming. And I remember when Tommy was saying that the seal are all tough sons of bitches, or they wouldn't yeah. be there. Yeah. <laughs> tough, tough sons of bitches. Yeah, you bet. Um, so Ed Parkin's like a very unlikely guy to wind up, but I guess through sheer mediocrity, he's one of the last men standing. Mediocrity. It's, it's the PETA principle. He said at the beginning of the show, and it's true. Uh, yeah, and and you know there ain't much left in in the world of Scientology spokespeople's. You know, Kareem Powell's name is kept around, sort of like uh, I don't know, just just because she's never been public, so nobody kind of knows whether she's alive or dead. But her, her name just keeps being stuck on the end of letters and statements that get sent to the media, which she doesn't usually write. And, we, and she's not allowed to speak in public because Miscavige doesn't like her French accent. So there isn't, you know, after the demise of, of that tough son of a bitch who just couldn't hack it in the Sea Org anymore, and he left, they then showed up with... If you remember, there was this woman called Erin Banks. Oh, yeah. yeah. A flash in the pan for a while, introducing Miscavige at, at uh, you know, she was the MC of his ribbon yanking ceremonies. And she was like, uh, appeared on a couple of TV shows, giving people tours of these ideologues. And her husband, Nick, and they were like the, the hot new properties. And now they've vanished. Yeah, they and then. Have yeah. Bob Adams, who I think might even still be on the the uh, website as quote unquote a spokesperson for Scientology, along with Linda Height, and those two have never been seen by anyone anywhere for any reason whatsoever. So all there is is Eddie Pocket and that's it. And he shows up in his ascot and weird hat and 
purple jacket and <laughs> manages to make a fool out of himself every time he sets foot on the sidewalk. So I suspect we're not going to see him much more, although that that persona may live on in, in the Twitterverse, just like Corinne Powell's persona lives on in the Scientology Letters to Mediaverse. You know, Mike, that is so very interesting. We, we could do a whole different show on Scientology's, you know, and how it's incompetent in handling social media. Yes. It's, it's very reactive, very incendiary. And what is so strange to me, Mike, is the pure schizophrenia of Scientology. It'll pay, you know, millions of dollars for a Super Bowl ad. Yeah. And yet at the same time, it's it's actively destroying people, actively going after you, going after Leah Remini, slander, libel, all manners of name calling your guests. And yet it wants good PR, even as it's proving every day how insane it is to the world. I mean, it's got to get to members of the Church of Scientology that this schizophrenia is not a good thing. I mean, this is... Uh, this is very disturbing to watch, but it's also interesting to, to narrate as a writer. And you, you cover it very well on your blog. I think you do an outstanding job. In, in your opinion, is it just thought stopping? What keeps Scientologists in when they see this kind of schizophrenic hostility over against phony PR? They, they, they just uh, ignore it, Jeffrey. It's like blinders. It's that simple. When yes, it's that simple. When you when you convince someone that every piece of information that they get, which is uh, negative about Scientology, is intended only to destroy man's only hope for total freedom, and prevent the clearing of the planet, then you easily dismiss the most blatant evidence in the world that is right in front of your face. And you not only dismiss the evidence, Jeff, you do things that are against your best interests. Look, just think about the people that keep giving money for these ideologues. These people hand over hundreds of thousands of dollars to an idea that when Miscavige yanks the ribbon on an ideal org, that this is somehow clearing the planet. But those people can walk into any one of these, quote, ideal orgs and see nothing is fucking happening. They are empty. There is nobody there. They are not clearing the planet. They are not accomplishing anything. Those people would be better off standing on a street corner and handing people $100 bills to go inside the org and take an OCA. That would be mo accomplishing more toward, quote, planetary clearing than what they currently do. But they don't want to see that. They, they actively avoid seeing things or recognizing and acknowledging them because they don't fit the pattern. And it the pattern or the, the belief that they have held on to, and that stuff is hard to give up. It's hard to go, uh-oh, I spent 10, 20, 30 years and two, four, six hundred thousand dollars on this, and it was bullshit. So it's like, you know, sunk money. You don't want to... You, you've got all this investment in this thing. You don't want the investment to now turn out to be shit, so you keep hoping that this investment is somehow going to work. I mean, the hallmark of Scientologists, Jeffrey, is the belief that what they are saying is happening today actually will happen tomorrow. Amazing. You know, faith, faith dies hard, but but beyond faith, Mike, it's an identity. Because if you're not a Scientologist in good standing, who are you? You lose your core identity. Yep. And when you lose your core identity, all sense of self goes.
the exit cost of leaving Scientology is immense. Unlike the Christian church, you can't just walk away. This is, you are gonna take a beating if you leave us and you're, you're gonna lose your family, you can lose your clientele. There's a battle for, to control the minds of Scientologists going on without, within the Office of Special Affairs. They're not doing a good job. How would you rate the Office of Scientology Special Affairs just objectively on, on this whole Stanley thing? How would I rate them? Yeah, I mean, what, does it have any strengths or is it all weaknesses? I mean, are they doing, yeah, how, how, how would you characterize it? Is this a total failure or is they're having some success? Just curious well, on an objective I, basis. It depends on your measuring stick, Jeffrey. Hmm. From the perspective of Scientology, they are having some success because they have something that they can show people who come in and say, my my boss told me that they watched the Aftermath show and, you know, told me that blah, 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 and now they have something that they can show them. And if that's your measure of success, well, then that's successful. Mm -hmm. But on the, on the bigger picture of are they achieving what they would ideally like to achieve, which is to convince the world that they're the good guys and the people that are speaking and telling about their abuses are just a bunch of lying bigots, they are dismal, dismal failures. And they're dismal failures because they do things that are stupid constantly, like having fake IDs and saying things that are provably false. You know, you, it, it's one thing to, to smear somebody uh, with innuendo and, 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 you know, cleverly done hit jobs. It's another to just be dumb and say things that anybody can prove are untrue. And they constantly do that. They constantly just pile on with stuff that is provably untrue, or they take the shortcut and just go, okay, we're going to publish from this person's confessional. And think that the world is going to look at that and go, oh yeah, these poor people are being set upon. That's interesting. So the bottom line is Scientology Stanley exists for internal damage control to try to retain members. Absolutely. But it's so short-sighted because they're doing it at the expense of destroying further their reputation here in the outside world. Well, that's exactly right, but that's not the equation that they operate on. They don't operate on that equation for anything, Jeffrey. Hmm. Nothing. Nothing that they do in the world is from the perspective of how is this impacting society or people at large, it is all done based on how is this going to look when I have to report on what I'm doing to my boss. It all rolls uphill in Scientology. Now leads to my last question, Mike. David Miscavige, the leader of the uh, Scientology cult, is not out in front leading. He's nowhere to be seen. Yep. And so it's, you know, David Miscavige, you'll see him drone on at length at a Scientology event for an hour, two hours, right? Yeah. Speaking in Shermanisms, but where the rubber really meets the road out here in the real world, he is nowhere to be seen. He's absent without leave. Why hasn't he spoken publicly about the Emmy Award winning show Scientology in the Aftermath? Where is David Miscavige? Why does he hide out? Well, there's two. <laughs> there's two reasons. Why doesn't he speak publicly about Scientology in the aftermath? That's one question, and I'll answer that, and there's two answers to it. One, he believes it is beneath his dignity to do so, that it's, be, it, it's beneath his station in life to do that. Uh, but that's partly, and, and realistically, because he's afraid that if he were to make commentary about that, and and express his opinion or or speak about it that it would open him up to a potential lawsuit mm. and he is paranoid 
really paranoid about ever being put in a deposition. And that's why he doesn't appear publicly, because he fears that someone will serve him with a subpoena, or there'll be a reporter there, or someone from the government to serve him with a subpoena. Or, at this point, he fears that someone with an iPhone, it will ask him a question that he can't answer, and it will go viral. Like, where's Shelley? Can you imagine Miscavige out in public where these days everybody has a cell phone and everybody can record you and walking up to him and saying, hey, hey, Miscavige, Miscavige, where's your wife Shelly? Couldn't do it. He can't deal with that. And that's just one example. There's many, many, many examples of things that he can't deal with. So he, in, in the... In the hallowed footsteps of L. Ron Hubbard has become a recluse. To think about that, he's following the same trajectory as Braun. In other words, he's become a prisoner of the machine, of the system itself. Correct. And he, he got rid of the last person who was uh, able to challenge him in any way or his authority, which is his wife, just like Hubbard did. And he lives in a bubble of sycophants who tell him that everything that he is doing is wonderful and keep him protected from the realities of the outside world. You write today on your blog, uh, today being February 27, 2019, of the physical violence at the top of the Church of Scientology. Right. So, Aaron Harvard, as you know, started the culture of violence in the Church. And it's perpetuated under David Miscavige. So he, he lives at the top in this culture of violence isolation right spying on people seeking to destroy censor scientology in the aftermath the critics you know at large and it's got to be a this this self-perpetuated paranoia at the top that's going to be very toxic long term for him and on top of that he's basically the one paradoxically who's been shuttered in the silence he's the one who can't speak and I think that's one of the greatest ironies of what's happening is David Miscavige had been silenced effectively, driven into hiding. Yeah, exactly. And what does that say about Scientology's uh, claim that it can confront anything when the only, their own leader is in hiding? He can't confront well, it's anything. Not, but Jeffrey, it's not just their own leader. I mean, general run-of-the-mill Scientologists cannot confront an SP if their life depended on it. If they believe that you are an SP, if they believe that you are, uh, are someone who, who has been designated an enemy of Scientology, they literally cross the street to walk away from you. They, I sat in a movie theater here near where I live and some Scientologists was sitting in the front row when I walked in and it was to see, interestingly, whatever, I walked in, they got up and left the movie theater. I went to the Nature's Food Patch, which is like this health food store down there near the Fort Harrison where there's lots of Scientologists go there. And people were literally jumping into the next aisle and looking around the corner to see which aisle I was going to walk up and down so that they wouldn't have to be in the same aisle. This is, this is the power of, of a suppressive person over Scientology. Yeah. They have granted so much power to suppressives who have, are seeking to destroy them that they buy their own bullshit. You know, Mike, that is just stunning on so many levels. I remember the... Uh, 2007 leaked Tom Cruise go to guns video. Yeah, where he's talking, he says, people ask me, have you ever seen an SP? Wow. And he goes, you know, maybe someday they'll just be in museums. Tom Cruise has gotten out of control. Now they're in the nature's patch supermarket and they're in your <laughs> motion picture theater. And you have to flee in abject terror. They're even on the USS Theodore Roosevelt while you're filming Top Gun too. Right. Crazy world, Mike. Now David Miscavige, is isolated and in hiding. He can't talk about Scientology in the aftermath. 
he has to remain silent. That's why he uses his flunkies like Ed Park and to attack you guys. I'm trying to reach out to Twitter to say, hey, the Stan League is organized hate campaign, fake accounts, fake people, stock photos. And it's all coming from the top of David Miscavige, who won't do anything about it, screaming at others to do something about it. And it's down to the, you know, the talent pool of the Ed Parkins. Interesting note, Mike, when I was at the uh, Stan League event there outside of Disney, Janet Weiland came up to me, asked me who I was. I told her. She thought for a minute, she said, oh, that Jeff, you know, the bad, the bad one, the bad Jeff, the SP. Now, <laughs> Jeff, oh, that Jeff. Oh, that Jeff. Yeah, you could just see her kind of, you could just see that, that look. And then she, she went off, she wouldn't engage in conversation with me. So she had me, Jeffrey Augustine, available to chat with. She could have talked to me. I mean, I was there on the sidewalk. I wasn't going anywhere. But Mike, she wouldn't even talk to me. I know. They, they, they got like, they think you got cooties that they're going to catch. Something, I guess. But it's interesting that you walk into a motion picture theater and they have to run away. Yeah. They can't be in the street. Yeah, it is. It's the big bad SP Mike Rinder. Mike, one more question that I must ask on behalf of listeners everywhere, um, or I will be beaten. <laughs> Season four aftermath. Any news? No, no news, Jeff. I, I and it's not because um, I'm withholding some information or Leah is withholding some information. There is just a lot of moving parts that go into a, a, a thing like this. There is the production company. There is the network. There is the audience. There is the 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 time and other commitments and all sorts of things and literally things are just up in the air right now as to what happens next and as soon as there is any information that is concrete that will be made known to everybody you know there's been a couple of things where little bits of information have leaked out and it creates such upset when those things don't turn out to be actually true because people are trying to offer something and say, look, this is what's going to happen, and this is what we're trying to make happen, and then that becomes, oh, this is, the, this is how it really is. So both Leah and I are trying to be careful to not do or say anything that gives the wrong impression to anybody one way or the other when we don't have complete control over what may be happening. If, if, if we could completely control it, if... If we were the ones that owned the production company or owned the network and we just had could make the say so, well, then we'd be talking like crazy and we'd just be rolling forward. But we're, that's not the position we're in, so we can't really, really say too much right now. Well, understood. And I appreciate the insights into that, but there is an army of people out here who love Leo Romney, love the show, love you. And it's, it's, affected such dramatic changes as we've been discussing today in social media it's revealed a lot about the church of scientology and what it does to people and it's just a tremendous show week in and week out so i do i do hope that eddie goes to season four because there's such a demand and it's 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 one of those shows that you watch and you go oh my god when you see it on television it's it's quite different than you know what you're just working on the internet right yeah, yeah, and uh, yes, yeah, it is. It's been it's been uh, sensational. So, thank you so much for all the work you and Leah do on the show, and appreciate you being on the show today, Mike. And, of course, uh, for Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you so much for listening. As always, we'll be in very good touch.